For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Or do not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit, and not in the old way of the written. Well, hello. It's great to be back here in this building and to celebrate friendships that I've known for many years and meet new people. Uh, one thing, it's quite a challenge for an old guy like me, one thing, uh, I had to choose one thing, uh, like the restoration of the church, the New Testament full of the Holy Spirit, those sort of things, the power of corporate prayer, some one things that uh, have excited me over the years. But I guess, as has been said, the one thing that uh, we have maybe been known for and has changed many lives is the message of the grace of God. I guess I've had more comeback from people who say that changed my life than any other theme, uh, the wonder of the grace of God. So I'm going to speak to you on the grace of God this morning. If you want one thing we could tell, well, it's the thing that changed everything for me. I was saved out of a very non-Christian background. My parents were not believers, never had a Bible in our home or anything like that, and got saved but terribly backslidden from the beginning. Uh, and then... Uh, after a particular preach, had my life arrested by God, absolutely captivated. I thought, right, I'm going to throw my whole lot in. And I think, without realizing it, became quite kind of legalistic in the way I outworked it because I wanted so much to put my old world behind me. I thought the best way is to get right into this and to be as uh, tight as I possibly can so that I don't drift back was my thinking. And uh, yeah, I gave up my job, I was full-time, Bible college, became a pastor, and yet always this kind of, am I doing enough? And that kind of cloud of condemnation that would drift over, even a pastor. And, uh, and then came a revelation of grace that absolutely set me free. And it was like being born again, again. And I could, it says about the resurrection of Jesus, they could not believe for joy. And I felt like that. I thought, wow, this is just too good to be true. But it is true, and it changed everything. So grace, yeah, the one thing. If there's one thing I want to say, it's get hold of the wonder of the grace of God. So let's pray and ask God to help us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We're so grateful for your presence. Come, Spirit of God. Be our teacher rest upon us now. We love your presence, Lord. We love it when you're here, when you lead us into truth. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the reading that we've had in chapter 5 of Romans is comparing and contrasting the outcome of Adam's sin and the outcome of Jesus' obedience. So we read in verse 17 of Romans 5, if by the transgression of one, death reigned through that one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness shall reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Jesus changed everything. Adam ruined the human race. He made us all sons of disobedience. He, he gave us that terrible bondage to guilt and sin and shame, and Jesus changed the whole thing for us. 
and through his wonderful grace, we can reign in life. Now, reigning in life is a very vivid phrase, isn't it? To reign in life, to be on top, not to be under the circumstances, not to feel everything's weighing down on you, guilt and shame, all kinds of stuff. No, we reign, we reign in life. It's a wonderful phrase. It's like, I'm on top. It's not the only verse that speaks like that. Elsewhere, it says we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not just conquerors, we're more than conquerors. And elsewhere, it says we always triumph through Christ Jesus. These are terrific phrases, more than conquerors, reigning in life, wonderful. And yet, for so many of us, we think, if only. And maybe it comes at a time when we, we set aside time, maybe we go to a conference and we, we put other things aside and we, we make ourselves available to God, more vulnerable perhaps, aiming for more, and we hear something from God and we think, I want to do better. Maybe the end of the year, you look back on the last year, you think, Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it to be like that, that's not the best, and the new year lies before you. You know, you've got a new diary, we haven't messed up one page yet, you think, right, I'm going to do better, I'm going to reign in life. That's the sort of thing that happens in our minds, we have moments of fresh momentum, fresh stirrings, that's great when that happens, because you can just kind of muddle along, so moments of fresh desire are terrific, they're a gift of God. But sadly, some of us go through the wrong door when we hear that. We think, right, I'm going to reign in life. What shall I do? I think I'll put my alarm clock an hour earlier. I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to pray longer. I'm going to read my whole Bible through this year. I'm going to read it right through this year. That's like four chapters a day. I'm going to do it. And we kind of set ourselves some rules to live by. We think, right, if I can do these things, I'll reign in life. That's a kind of normal response. It happens to people. They set themselves targets. And we think, if I can keep the rules, I'll be okay. And Paul writes to the Galatians, and he says, you who would be justified by laws have fallen away from grace. That's an interesting phrase, fallen from grace. We tend to use it wrongly, actually, because Paul invented the phrase. He knows what he means. When we say someone's fallen from grace, we often mean they don't come to church anymore. You know, they're somehow not, they're backslidden, they've fallen from grace. That's not what Paul meant. Paul said this, when you take up law, you've fallen from grace. That's what he's meaning. That's what he's saying. What are you doing, you guys? You've fallen from grace. Why did he say that? Well, he wrote a letter to the Galatians And the Galatians were people he had preached to, and there was a church formed, and the Spirit fell, and they were everything God wanted in this new covenant, a people loving Jesus, worshiping him, the presence of God, signs, wonders, miracles, all happening in Galatia, terrific church, a new covenant community. And Paul, being an apostle, went on to do it again somewhere else. He's going to plant another church. And when he left, the Judaizers moved in behind him. Well, who are the Judaizers? Well, the Judaizers are Christians, but probably with a very strong Jewish background, rooted still in old covenant thinking. And they come in among these guys, and they say, hey, welcome, you Gentiles, you non-Jews. We're so thrilled that you've accepted our Messiah. Welcome. Our, Our Bible's told us that the Gentiles would come. You're the fulfillment of our prophecy. Welcome, welcome. Uh, But we've known him a long time. I mean, we've known him for centuries. We, we actually know what he requires. And welcome, but um, you shouldn't eat that kind of food anymore. And you must keep the special feast days. And you must keep the Sabbath. And really, you should be circumcised. They came in and said, look, in order to make sure all is okay, okay, you've received the Messiah, welcome in, but to make sure everything's okay, You need to add these other things to to be absolutely right with God. And Paul writes to them his most angry epistle. Galatians is his angriest epistle, even angrier than Corinthians. He says, you fools, who has bewitched you? You're really losing the way. And in Romans he says, he says this, sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law, you're under grace. That's quite a statement, you're not under law, you're under grace. See, Jesus said the law will never pass away. That's Jesus. Jesus said the law will never pass away. Paul says you're not under law, 
uh, who's right? If I was to ask a show of hands, you know, which of you would say a Christian is not, I'm not under law, or I am under law? And you, where am I on this? I won't ask, but I think sometimes we get confused. Where, where, what is my relationship with the law? How, how do I walk with God? How do I please God? Now, for me, when I became a Christian, no one said, no, you know, don't forget this and don't do that. They, they did say Old Testament rules, but it was like, now you're a Christian. I was told this, you must have a quiet time. I thought, what's a quiet time? It sounded very quaint from a non-Christian. What's a quiet time? What, what on earth are you talking about? Oh, you must read your Bible every day. You must pray every day. That's, that's, that's what, how it came to me. It's like, you've got to do this. And I was told things like this. Uh, you shouldn't probably wear that kind of stuff anymore. And uh, can you do your hair differently? It was like, uh, okay, got it, uh, got it, uh, got it, yeah, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, I feel so relieved by the gospel. I'm so, so released by it. Actually, I felt, I've picked up a lot of responsibility here. I didn't feel released, I felt, oh, okay, the stuff I've got to do, which is what was happening here. Stuff you've got to do to make sure you're okay. So we had a second reading brought to us from Romans 7, and I want to turn there because in Romans 7, the opening half a dozen verses, Paul sets out a, a kind of illustration which I think is the most succinct and clear statement in the New Testament. I mean, the whole of Galatians is about it, Colossians is about it, Romans is about it, but here, just in half a dozen verses, it, it kind of encapsulates what it is for us. So we read it uh, just now. Don't you know, brothers, that we are under the law. We're married like a married woman, for the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. He, he uses marriage as an illustration. It's like the law is our husband. He's saying, you shall not do this, you shall not do that. He has kind of got authority over us. We, Christians, are somehow related to him through marriage. We've become like married to him. And he's making all his holy requirements. This is what you must do to be my bride. Okay, okay. That's how it's going to be. And you can't argue with him because he's right. I mean, they're terrifically good rules. You can't say, I disagree. No, they're good rules. But somehow it kind of traps us. And there's another thing to remember, which we'll come back to. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters who accuses us day and night. See, Satan... You don't avoid Satan by not going downtown Brighton. You know, won't go down there. Satan's down there. No, Satan comes to you while you're trying to pray. When you start praying, he'll come to you and say, is that it then? He'll accuse you. He'll say, you're not doing enough. He's the accuser. And so he will come behind this relationship and try and spoil it for us, okay? So we've got this husband who's saying, this is the holy standard. This is what I require of you. He's absolutely right, so we can't argue with him. But he never, ever lifts a finger to help. He doesn't come alongside. I don't want to see too many wives saying, hmm, sounds familiar. No, look, this, is, this husband, he's right. He's absolutely great. But he doesn't actually help you. And J Jesus said, he's never going to die. What a wonderful relationship. Isn't religion great? We're into this overbearing husband. He's always right. He's pure and holy. He doesn't help you. He's never going to die. Now, it sounds like, the way Paul spells it out, it sounds like he needs to die so he can marry somebody else. That's what the passage, that's what it says. He's like, he's got jurisdiction as long as you both live, and he's not going to die, so you're in trouble. Then verse 4, this wonderful verse. Verse 4, therefore, my brothers, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. That's an amazing releasing statement. You were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. What does that mean? Well, you'll only find the word Christian three times in the New Testament. Search for it, you'll find Christian three times. But in Christ, you'll find everywhere. Again and again and again. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Many, many verses are talking about our being in Christ. So this is what this passage is about. It's about our being in Christ. And Christ has, if we can put it this way, two relationships with the law. This is the first one, perfect obedience. He's described as innocent. That's God's description of his son, innocent. Jesus said, 
Satan's coming, he's got nothing on me. Which of you convinces me of sin? Those are the words of Jesus. They're the words of a man assured of his holiness, his innocence. So he's in perfect relationship with the law. He kept the law. He fulfilled the law. He's happy about the law. But when we come to the cross, the Bible says this, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. In that moment, there was this extraordinary transformation that he became the personification of sin. He was made to be sin on the cross. He hung there. He was forsaken. He was cursed. He hung and bore the guilt of our sin, our shame. God made him to be sin. He took our place, not just for forgiveness, but he dealt with the relationship with the law. He died to the law once and for all. The law is vindicated. God didn't say, okay, I'll just drop the standard a bit. No, no, God can't do that. God is holy and righteous and eternal and glorious. He can't say, oh, we'll let them off. This has to be dealt with. And a perfect sacrifice was offered, and the law was satisfied, justified, and death has happened. The soul that sins, it shall die, and Jesus took our place. And he died to the law. And here it says in verse 4, you, you were made to die to the law, through the body of Christ, through your engagement with Christ, your involvement with Christ, you were made to die to the law. It's over, it's finished. We never go back to him. Now, some would say, hey, that's so dangerous. I was preaching this sort of a message once in Spain. It was a very, very hot day, and a, a privilege to preach there. And I was in the middle of my preach, and a guy stood up wearing a suit in this very hot day. And he said, I've never heard anything so outrageous in all my life. That's what I was preaching. It was kind of fun. I thought, wow, this is exciting. And I said, I said, brother, if you'll wait till I've finished, I think you'll see where I'm going. He was outraged. I would say, no, your relationship to law is over. It's just what the Bible says. It's finished. It's over. It's not, well, you need a bit of law to make, no, no, no. Hebrews says, the law made nothing holy. It doesn't make anything holy. It can't do it. It's not capable of doing it. And so we don't need a little law to make sure we're all right. We are set free from the law. It says in verse 6, now you have been released from the law. The word is discharged. Discharged. The great Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones uses the illustration of a soldier who's perhaps done military service for a couple of years. He's just done whatever the sergeant major tells him to do. You know, left, right, left, right, do it. You just obey the sergeant. Then there comes the day when you're discharged. And he imagines the soldier walking across the parade ground. He's got no tie on. He's got his jacket over his shoulder. He's strolling along. And the sergeant comes around the corner. He says, soldier. He says, oh, sir, wait a minute. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Bye, Sarge. And he says, let the veins stand out on his neck very highly and scream. He can't touch you. You are discharged. That's what it says here. You're dis I am discharged from the law. We have died to that which held us captive. Well, what does it say in verse 4? You were made to die to the law through the body of Christ that you might be joined to. See, it's not the end of the story. You have died to him that you might be joined to another. Now, that joined to is marriage language. You died to that husband in order that you might be joined to this new husband. Well, who is he? To him who was raised from the dead. We know who that is, don't we? that we might be joined to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. What a wonderful verse this is. You see, there's no reference here to bearing fruit with the law. That old husband didn't make me bear fruit. He told me the rules, he told me the standards, but he didn't make me fruitful. I died to that husband in order that I might be joined to this husband, that I might bear fruit for God. Because this new husband says things like this, my peace I give you. Oh, my joy, I give it to you. Wow. My love, I pour it out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. This is a new husband. This is a new husband. It says in Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 21, a very important statement. It says, if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would have come by the law. If a law had been given which was able to impart life, 
then righteousness would come by the law. So let's get all our kids at New Day, or let's go out in the town this weekend and shout, you shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not commit adultery. Wow, we've done it. We've told them. If a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would come by the law, but it doesn't impart life. It points out sin. It doesn't impart life. That old husband was impotent. He couldn't impart any life. So we're discharged from him. Hallelujah. We've died to him. It's all over. That we might be joined to this new husband, who he's a very potent husband. He says, abide in me and I in you. You'll bear much fruit. This is a new deal. And it's not a mixture of the old and the new. It's totally new. A new relationship. See, some Christians, you say, how are you doing? And they say things like, oh, I've been up and down, a bit up and down. It's not so much up and down as husband to husband. We're guilty of that. We go husband to husband. It's like, I don't feel I'm doing very well at the moment. Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm not really where I should be. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Lord. I will do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. That will really, you know, try that in the world. I'll develop my relationship with my old husband to really improve our relationship. It's nonsense, it doesn't work. But people do it, they go back, I'm not doing very well, I'll try harder to keep these rules. And that isn't the way. Jesus is the way, we don't need a way to the way, he is the way. He says to the backslidden church in Laodicea, I'm outside. You've got lukewarm. What happened to you? I'm knocking the door. If anybody hears my voice and keeps the no, and hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and sup with him. Oh, wow. This is a wonderful life imparting husband full of gentleness. You see it with Simon Peter. Peter, do you love me? He just said, I'm not with him. I don't know him. He's about to be crucified. I am not with him. I don't know him. Cursed and swore and said, I don't know him. Jesus comes knocking his door. Peter, do you still love me? Do you know I love you? It's a love relationship with a new husband, beloved. You don't go back and think, I'll try and earn his love. You can't earn his love. It's free. We reign in life because of this. We've been set free from religion and trying to do stuff to please God. It's over. Now, we have God coming to us, making us bear fruit for his glory, giving us his spirit freely, because Jesus gives us freely, graciously. You see, but you might say, well, tell me, don't you read the Bible anymore then, if you don't have to? Yeah, I read it. I want to know about God. This amazing trinity. This, this, this God who became a man, became a child, I want to know more about it. He's amazing. Oh, he lived a life like us. I've just heard of someone at New Day who lost his pillow. This one had nowhere to lay his head. It's grim trying to sleep without anywhere to lay your head. Jesus took on our human. I want to know as much as I can about him. I do not read it to impress God. I don't say, hey, whole chapter to the Lord. Do I make marks for that? I'm not trying to impress God. I've already found one who's already impressed him. I don't need to. Jesus has done it. And so when you wake in the morning, beloved, sometimes, you see, when we pray, people have told us, some people have told you, first thing to do when you pray is start with confession. You know, just come to clean the decks. Helps you to come. It's rubbish. People say, I'm so sorry, Lord. Can I just clean the decks? Just come with, sorry about that, Lord. You see, you have an accuser the accuser of the brothers and sisters, who accuses them day and night, it says in the Bible. So you come and say, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry about this. And you say, and what about that? Oh, yeah, isn't that true? And sorry about, oh, yeah, and I'm sorry about, oh, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm such a terrible sin. And you see, prayer is misery. Some people hate praying, it's so hard. Jesus said to his apostles, not to little children, they said, teach us to pray. He said, this is what you say, our Father, are in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's not a little prayer for children. That's a prayer for apostles who ask their leader, how do we pray? Father, hallowed be your name. That's how you start. Father, Father. I love to sing when I'm worshiping, when I'm praying in the morning. I sing, Father, I can call you Father. 
for I am your child today, tomorrow, and always. You are my father. Father, I will serve you, Father. I will seek your face. I love being a child of God. I'm not coming, I don't, my relationship with God is not sin-centered. Because Jesus has dealt with that. It's father-centered. Father, I love you. Father, I praise you. Father, I want your name hallowed. I want your kingdom to come. If you use the Lord's Prayer, as I do, as a kind of structure of prayer, you will come to and forgive us our trespasses. It's not that we're careless. Do you remember the time when Peter said to Jesus, hey, you're not washing my feet. Jesus starts washing their feet. And they say, hey, Peter says, you're not washing my feet. He says, if I don't wash your feet, you're in trouble. He said, oh, wash me all over then. And Jesus said, you're all clean. You're clean. I just need to wash your feet. And sometimes our feet get dirty. We, get, we do things we shouldn't have done. If, we, if any man does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we live as children of the King. We live in his presence. We reign in life through the abundance of grace and the free gift, the free gift of righteousness. Otherwise, what Paul says about his contemporaries is they go about trying to establish a righteousness of their own based on law instead of accepting the gift. They got it all wrong. It's a bit like us, if I can put it this way. Imagine I'm one of the wives here. And, and so tomorrow morning we get up to pray. We say, Lord, I pray for my husband. Bless him at work. Lord, let his testimony be heard. Let his light shine. Lord, give him opportunity to witness for you. Lord, I think he's so tired at the moment. Lord, I just think he's really needy. Huh? How can I encourage him? I'd love to encourage him. Maybe I could get, I'll get a nice meal for him. Yeah, I know. I'll get a nice meal. I'll, 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 I'm going to buy him a steak. I'm gonna, and then Satan comes and says, oh, praying. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I was supposed to be praying. Uh, praying. Uh, uh, bless the missionary supper this weekend. When the missionaries come and talk about what they're doing in Africa, and, and we put on the supper. Lord, Lord bless the, uh, the supper. I said, I'll do the quiche. I haven't done the quiche. And, I, and I've got to do the salad. I haven't got any salad. Oh, I'll go, down, I'll go and get, oh, I know. I'll get the salad, and I can get the steak at the same time. <laughs> that I, can, I can do, oh, that's great. Then Satan comes, you see. Satan isn't downtown, he's here. He's saying, oh, mighty woman of intercession, are you prevailing in the heavenlies? You think, prevailing in the heavenlies? I can't pray for toffee. I'm useless. I try my brain, go, I'm a useless Christian. <laughs> see, now that's what happens. I better get on with my Bible reading. Where was I? Yeah, my Bible reading. Let's catch, I need to catch up with my Bible reading. That's what I'll do. Where was I? Yeah, I got to Leviticus, hadn't I? Leviticus, <laughs> you shall remove from the offering all the fat of the bull of the sin offering and the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that's on them. <laughs> which is on the loins and the lobe of the liver, which you shall remove with the kidneys. <laughs> you see, and, and you think, Satan says, getting a lot out of it, are we? <laughs> oh, I'm a hopeless Christian. I don't understand the Bible. I can't pray. I'm a, user. I'm a sinner. Oh, God. See, that, that's what happens. That is what happens. See, I'm, I'm reading through Jeremiah at the moment. Some chapters, you think, oh, boy, this is heavy. Another chapter, oh, this is good. See, it's reading the Bible, that's not... I don't, that's not my relationship with God. I love the truth. I love praying. But I'm not doing it to impress God. And if I have a boring morning, that's not like, if I sleep through my quiet time, Jesus is my righteousness. Good morning, Lord. We're righteous. That's a gift. Through the mercy of God. God has done it. God has done it. And he's declared us righteous as a gift. Otherwise, we kind of imagine my right arm is my sense of condemnation. I'm trying to cover it up by my Christian activity, what you might call sanctification. I'm praying my Bible. I'm praying. I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing what I can. And Satan accuses you. Think, no, I'm doing what I can. I'm trying. I'm trying hard. And, and then he says, "Have you heard about Jane? No, what about Jane? She fasts twice a week. Oh no, fasts twice a week." 
got to do that as well. And I pray, read my Bible, fast twice a week. And Satan comes and says, how are you doing? I'm doing better, thank you. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm fasting twice a week. Oh, I expect you're pleased. Yes, I am pleased. I expect you're proud. Yes, I am. Oh, no, I'm proud. See, some Christians think, I can't win. If I'm, if I'm doing badly, I'm doing badly. If I'm doing good, I get proud I'm doing badly. And some people walk away because Christianity is too hard to keep up. That's a tragedy. Jesus came for the weak. He came to save us. He came to rescue us. Not to put a load of burdens on us. Yeah, he's given us a word that will nourish us. But we don't work out our guilt on that basis. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is it true for you? It's important that we understand. We reign in life through the abundance of grace. The free gift, the free gift. Even in the Old Testament, they had to bring their lambs to be offered. They had to be a perfect lamb. You can't say, oh, I don't need that lamb. It's got a sickness. Give that to God. No, no, that won't do. It has to be a perfect lamb. And so you present your lamb to the priest and the priest would inspect the lamb. Is it blind? Has it got any broken limbs? Is it diseased? See, you're not thinking, I hope the priest doesn't notice this is all torn. And I've got all mud on here. It's not relevant. It's not even looking at you. All eyes are on the priest, on the, on the lamb. All eyes are on the lamb. And if the lamb is good, the priest will use these words, I find no fault in him. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong with my lamb. That's why we win through. There's nothing wrong with our lamb. It's like at the Passover, the blood is outside the door. It's not for me to see. It's God. When God says, when I see the blood, only God knows the value of the blood of the Lamb. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Hallelujah. God knows the value of it. God's happy. God's satisfied. If God's satisfied, we can be satisfied. We have peace with God because he's satisfied. That's the basis. Not because of what I'm doing, but because he's satisfied. The blood satisfies it. It's an innocent, perfect lamb. I was once in prayer. This honestly happened to me. I was praying one day, and I felt God spoke to me. And I felt he said to me, don't fear. Because I had in my mind this thought of when Isaac was blind and old, he had a son that he really loved. He called Esau. Esau was his beloved son. Then there was Jacob, the other one, who was a crook and a cheat. And one day he came to his blind old father hidden in the clothing of Esau. Esau, the son that he loved, this manly young son. He hid himself in that. And he, and he put skins around his hand and around his neck, and he went pretending to be the son that the father loved, hoping to get a blessing. And he's drawing near, and, and I felt God says to me, don't fear as you draw near to me that I'll find you hidden in the son that I love. Because I put you in the son that I love. It's my arrangement. Ephesians chapter 1, we are accepted in the son that he loves. He placed us there. He's given us a righteousness that's not our own, which he's delighted with. And when I come to God, I often say, Lord, catch the fragrance of his obedience. I, th I love looking at Gethsemane. I think, Lord Jesus, you are amazing. That You came to Gethsemane, you shuddered. Is it possible? No, no, for this purpose came I to this hour. For this purpose, what a winner, what a wonderful saviour, what a tremendous son that Father can celebrate. I'm hidden in him. Hallelujah. God sees me hidden in this marvellous, breathtaking, glorious son. He put me there. He delights in you because you're in Christ. He doesn't put up with you. He delights in you. He celebrates over you with singing, the Bible says. And he made the arrangement. Jacob was a crook and a cheat. But for us, it's God. And he got blessed there. Some of you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Say, I'm not worthy of it. Of course you're not. But you're hidden in Christ. And you receive the blessing because you're hidden in Christ. I pray for so many people to be filled with the Spirit. And you come to someone and they're crying before you get to them. I'm not worthy. Of course you're not worthy. Some people say, maybe God's waiting for me. How long is he going to wait? We come as we are. And we receive blessings because we're in Christ. Hallelujah. It's wonderful, the word of grace. It's wonderful. 
sets us free. We reign in life because we're not vulnerable to be being put under condemnation again. It can't touch us. I'll close with this illustration. John Bunyan, the famous author of Pilgrim's Progress, he said one day he was walking, he was feeling low. And he saw a vision of Christ as his righteousness. Fascinating, this old Puritan sort of vision. He saw a vision of Christ as his righteousness. And he said, I recognized in that moment I could do nothing to add to that righteousness. And feeling low could not take away from that righteousness. He is my righteousness. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Forever. He's my righteousness. It says in Hebrews, by one offering, he has perfected us for all time. Hallelujah. By one offering. A Hebrew writer compares with the old priests of the Old Testament to keep on offering, keep on offering, keep on offering. They couldn't sit down. They had to do another offering, another offering. And the book of Hebrews says he sat down. For why? By one offering, he's perfected us for all time. Hallelujah. Beloved, we reign in life we reign in life, not because of our cleverness, strength, but because of the grace of God. It sets you free. It sets you free. Yeah, You'll find out a lot more from that book, God's Lavish Grace, but that's the foundation stone. Let's just pray. And then we'll sing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the wonder of your incarnation, the stunning, stunning wonder that the God of glory took on human form. Lord, we thank you. Moves with compassion. You stepped down from your throne. You woke up a child. You lived that spotless life. You won the victory in the wilderness over Satan's temptations. We thank you. You're stunning and wonderful. We thank you. You gave us as a gift your righteousness. I pray for my dear friends here this morning that each of us nestle into the free gift of God, celebrate it, rejoice in it, walk in freedom, know the wonder of the grace of God. Please, Lord, make it our joy to know this and celebrate it. In Jesus' name, amen.